Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so very much for um, responding to the email announcement that I sent to you. Hopefully I'm able to get this up by 4 o'clock. I just finished my other class, but I wanted to make sure that I at least had the video recorded and ready to upload to you so that you would have access to it. I'm not going to take a lot of time, but I do want to remind you to make sure that you take your quiz that's available today through Saturday. It's on chapters 1 and 2. And I'm going to go over chapter 3 and 4 right now. Chapter 4 is not as uh, top heavy as chapter 3, so I want to make sure that you have a pretty good understanding of everything. Also, make sure that you have access to your PowerPoint presentation. I'm looking at it on the computer that's right here in front of me, and I have my textbook right here. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email about anything that I discussed today, and you will have access to this video lecture from now until 4 p.m. next Thursday, which is the hour of class, to review as needed. So, let's go ahead and get started. Regressive tissue changes, and if you're in Chapter 3 along with me, and I'm pulling up the presentation. Um, regressive tissue changes are those things that can happen to the cell to eventually affect the tissue. Because remember, going back to the different levels of organization, the cell is the basic unit of structure and function. So if there are any cellular changes, eventually it will potentially uh, affect the tissues as well. So the three types of regressive changes that we're going to identify include infiltration, which is just like what it sounds, something comes in and takes over. Degeneration, where something can be present and over a period of time, it will cause the cell to have a disruption in its metabolism, eventually affecting the tissue. And then finally, atrophy. And atrophy should be something that you um, that we'll talk about, and there's a hyperlink to it, but it's something that's really very easy to understand. But since we are now in path, we have to understand that there's a difference between functional or physiological atrophy as opposed to pathological atrophy. So when we get there, I'll highlight that for you as well. Okay, so if you're looking in the textbook, the first section that it begins to talk about is the potential causes of cellular injury, which are some of the things that I just identified for you, but there's a very important key term in there that you do need to know, and that is hypoxia. Okay, so I'm looking at this as I'm videotaping it, and I believe that it's probably, I'm gonna, it's the mirror image, so I'm going to see if I can fix that. If I can't fix that, then I'll have it fixed for the next time that I try to do that. I'll figure out what's what. Okay, so hypoxia. Hypoxia is a loss or the reduction of oxygen to a particular area, which is something that we need to talk about because hypoxia can lead to different conditions. Hypoxia... If there's, not enough, if, if there's not enough oxygen that's getting to the tissue, then eventually that tissue will become uh, necrotic or it could lead to necrosis. And necrosis is cellular death or death of the tissue. But an area, if you have an entire area that's beginning to uh, lose its source of oxygen, it can lead to what's called an infarct. An infarct is an area where the tissue is beginning to die. And should the tissue die, then eventually the organ will die. Perfect example, we know a heart attack to be known as a myocardial infarction. The word infarction is indicating that a portion of the tissue has died, and as a result, it has disrupted the organ, and the organ can no longer function. So we'll talk about those. But that's in that first section in regard to potential causes of cellular injury. Injury. So we're going to go right into the first type of regressive tissue change, and that's infiltration. As I'm looking through the textbook, <clears throat> at the bottom of page 33, that last paragraph, talks once again about osmotic pressure. And remember, osmotic pressure is going back to that concept in anatomy about the amount of fluid that goes in as opposed to the amount of fluid that goes out. So I would encourage you to make sure you recall the hypotonic, the isotonic, and the hypertonic uh, environments that the cell could potentially find itself in. In addition to that, what is the end result if too much water goes into the cell? What would cellular death be called at that point? I'm listening. That would be plasmoptosis, 
And what is it when too much water goes out of the cell and it eventually loses its metabolism and dies? That would be plasmolysis. So just go back and review that information as it talks about it at the bottom of page 33 and the top of page 34. Okay, so moving on. The first type of degener degeneration we're talking about is cellular swelling. And it sounds like just exactly what it is. Something comes into the cell, disrupts the metabolism. It could be water. It could be a solute. And causes it to begin to swell. So on that first slide under degeneration, it talks about the hypotonic uh, situation that can occur within the cell, causing it to swell to the point that it may rupture, leading to plasmoptosis. It can occur from minor injuries or illness, or the cell could also succumb to fatty degeneration, which is just like what it sounds. Fat comes into the tissue, the fat disrupts the met metabolism, the cell can no longer function, and as a result, the cell can die. On the PowerPoint presentation, I have two examples, the microscopic view of the liver, and when you look at that diagram, those areas that you see that are very large, white, round areas, those are the areas that the fat is present within the liver. Looking at the gross Oh, I don't think it's going to come up. I tried to click on the link for the gross anatomy of the liver, which actually might come up for you, but right now it's not coming up on my computer. Uh, but it shows the liver at twice its normal size. And not only that, with fatty degeneration, you can also see a difference in the color change of the liver because fat typically has a yellow, yellowish coloration to it, thus the liver took on that coloration as well in fatty degeneration. Next in the slide is in regard to amyloid disease, abnormal, abnormal accumulation of amyloid in the cell. This is kind of a waxy filament type of material. And if you click on the hyperlink, as I am trying to do, there it is. It shows you, it says this Congo red stain reveals amorphous orange red deposits of amyloid. So those areas that you see that are uh, the difference in color, the rest of the slide is more of a yellowish tinge, but the areas where the amyloid is present, it's in red, causing the tissue to break down. Okay. Next slide, infiltration. This is the one where something will actually come in and literally take over the cell. We've got three types that we're going to identify, well, four types really that we're going to identify under pigmentation. So we have exogenous pigments, endogenous pigments, there's calcification, which is exactly what it sounds, calcium comes in, and then we'll talk about gout as well. So at the bottom of page 34, moving over to page 35, let's talk about the pigments. So first we have coal dust anthracosis 1 and anthracosis 2. It's also referred to as black lung disease. Uh, it's a form of pneumoconiosis. And pneumoconiosis is just the inhalation of some type of particulate matter, be it coal, be it stone, be it dust. That's pneumoconiosis, something that's coming in and disrupting uh, respiration. With black lung disease, <clears throat> this would be one of those occupational types of diseases. So go back and try to recall whether or not that would actually be uh, predisposing or if that would be an immediate or excitatory disease. So when you click on the first link, you will notice you can see black streaks beneath the lobes of the lung. You can see the visceral pleura that's actually covering the lung, but beneath the surface, you can see the deposits of coal as they are. In anthracosis one, same thing, but it's at the microscopic view, and it looks like it's a lot more prevalent here, but this, I don't know if this is from the same um, specimen sample, but you can clearly see the, uh, it says, anthracosis is nothing more than accumulation of carbon pigment, pigment from breathing dirty air. So this is one in regard to smokers have the most pronounced anthracosis, and that's what you can see. 
And then finally, anthracosis II. Once again, another microscopic view where you can see the difference in coloration of the tissue. So these are pigments that come from outside. And let's see. In your text, it only identifies black lung disease, but there's also, uh, for example, and I'll just give you an example of Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble. They worked in a stone quarry and they were breaking up pieces of stone. Well, a type of pneumoconiosis that they could have developed was silicosis because silicon is a type of stone. And in hammering the stone, it's a potential that very fine particles are in the air that they begin to breathe but they don't know and it deposits or will be deposited inside of the lung, particularly inside the, at the cellular level and disrupt the cell, the tissue and eventually the organ. Okay, so that's, those are exogenous pigments, those that come from the outside, but we also have those that are already inside of our bodies that could potentially be harmful. The first endogenous pigment that we're going to identify, or the one that we're going to identify for this chapter, is um, the one that is actually a part of the, has a, it's a part of the liver, and that's bilirubin, and we already know in cases of jaundice that there's a conversion and if we use a solution, an arterial solution or embalming solution that is too strong, we could potentially turn our jaundice case green, which is irreversible. One of the key ways that we can determine whether or not a case has jaundice is to look at the sclera of the eye. The sclera is the white of the eye. So here in the first hyperlink, we'll see bilirubin. And you can see the area, the yellow-green globular material seen within the small bile ducts of the liver is the bilirubin. And that's the conversion that goes on if we use the solution that is too strong. Bilirubin is converted to biliverdin, thus the case could potentially turn green. And then the next two hyperlinks are just showing you the sclera of the eye and how you can determine whether a case is jaundice. And then the last hyperlink, obviously, is the jaundice of the skin, the yellowing pigment as well. Calcification is another type of pigmentation that can go on. Um, calcification, if you are looking at it, is when calcium is deposited into the cell. And <clears throat> other minerals are included as well, but we call it calcification because it can deposit a hard material in the cell. And the hyperlink that you're looking at right now under calcification, it actually shows the lumen of a vessel. And inside of that lumen, you can see what looks like something sticking to the wall of it. Well, you'll note that what is attached to the wall is occluding that vessel. So that's going to reduce blood flow. Reducing blood flow leads to hypoxia. Hypoxia can lead to an infarct or ischemia as well, which ischemia is the reduction of uh, oxygen, as, oxygen as well. The infarct is the death of the tissue, and then finally necrosis is the ending result, the death of either the tissue and the organ. So we have hypoxia, the reduction of oxygen. Ischemia is the reduction of oxygen to a part. We have the infarct, the area that's not receiving the oxygenated blood will then begin to uh, die, and then finally death of the tissue is necrosis. Get this up. Next, we have gout. Now, I've never had gout, but I have known people that have had gout, and from what I understand, it's an extremely painful condition. Um, my aunt had it one time, and she couldn't even put her shoes on. She didn't even want to put on any socks, slippers, or anything because it was that painful for her. And what it is, is the buildup of uric acid inside of the blood, like little crystals inside of your bloodstream. And it's trying to flow through the vascular system. But you can imagine with those, some of those vessels that are so very small, trying to throw through the, flow through the vascular system and it's crystallized can cause immense pain. It can be chronic, but it typically is acute in onset, but it can lead to a chronic condition. Okay, so if you turn the page to page 36, then we have the word necrosis, cellular death. Necrosis is a sequence of structural changes that follow uh, cell death and living tissue. All dead cells are not necrotic, tissue placed in specimen bottom, so on and so forth. Necrosis, the eventual death of a tissue. But before it gets to that, 
there are some things that can occur. And if you look down